And chapter 3 starts kind of a, it's, it's a pivotal point in this letter to Colossians. As with a lot of Paul's letters, he writes them in a way that he starts out with, you say doctrine, you say theology. He starts out writing, giving us truths to believe. Things to believe about what Jesus did, what he accomplished for us, what his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension did for all of humanity and did for those who believe in him. And after Paul kind of lays out these truths and these, these things for us to hold tightly to, he usually then changes gears and goes, okay, now this is how it's supposed to impact your life. Here's what you're supposed to do with these truths. He usually starts out with, like I said, we're going to be in chapter 3 for, for a good minute. It's going to be a, a several weeks, probably. And it's funny, too, because as you start reading into chapter 3, like, this is going to sound so bad. Which just let you know how my dumb brain works sometimes. And I'm like, all the good stuff starts in verse 5. Like, you get into all the, like, all the juicy stuff starts happening in verses 5 on. So, like, I want to just breeze through the first four verses and jump right in to the craziness. But there's a reason that Paul, being inspired by the Holy Spirit in writing this, he starts with these first four verses. And if we do overlook them or just read right the next verses, it can get taken so far out of context, so far out of sync, and it's just not going to be good. And what he says in these four verses are important enough for us to spend an entire week on. So, chapter 3, starting at verse 1. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Whatever translation you have, you should be able to follow along pretty well. It says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So to give you, like, again... Paul is getting into application now. He's going into the things that he's going to start telling us, this is what you need to do. But we need to take that in the full scope of this letter. That's why we try to review every week, just so we follow this flow. We're not trying to just pull pieces out and make them stand on their own and make them say things that they don't say. So, just to do a quick review, Paul starts this letter. He's writing to a church of people that he's never met before, this church in Colossus. He's in prison. His buddy Epi, remember we agreed on Epi because we don't know if it's Epaphras or Epaphras, so we'll just call him Epi. Epi comes, visits him, tells him about this church, and Paul writes a letter. He starts the letter being like, look, I've never met you all, but I thank God for you. You are an awesome church. Everything I'm hearing about you is great. Your love for each other is amazing. Your faith in Jesus Christ is amazing. Your hope in eternal life is amazing. I praise God for you. But I understand there are pressures coming in at you from every angle. There are things in your life from within you, from around you, from false teachers among you, trying to get you to compromise the very thing you put your faith and trust into. And so as Paul's writing this letter to tell him, don't compromise. He's like, so I'm praying for you guys. I'm praying that God would give you all the knowledge of him and his will in your life. I'm praying God would fill you with spiritual wisdom and understanding so that everything you do will be pleasing to him. You'll walk in a manner worthy of him, and you'll grow more and more like him the more you know him. He says, and I'm also praying, because, gang, that's going to be hard. I'm praying that God gives you all the strength and endurance and patience you need for this life, and that your heart would be maintained with joy and thankfulness. And after he prays for them, and he's like, you know what, and model that as your prayer life. Don't compromise your prayer life. Pray for the real spiritual things that God has for you. And then Paul just starts laying out the gospel to them. He's like, look, I know your faith in Jesus is amazing, but let me make sure y'all know what really happened to you when you put your faith in Christ. And he starts just setting off fireworks of what the gospel, of that domain of darkness, and you are now living eternally in the kingdom of the Son. He's like, and did you also know that in that kingdom, the one who rules that kingdom sitting on his throne invites you to come into his presence? God invites you into his presence, and he says, when you come into his presence, Jesus himself ushers you in and presents you to God holy and blameless without a single fault in his eyes. Did you know that right now? And he goes even further, he's like, and not just that, but Christ himself through his spirit now lives in you. Can you believe that, gang? 
Then he says, and what you need to start doing, you need to start getting together as the local body, as the body of Christ, gathering together as a church, and y'all need to make sure you're holding each other up to that. You need to make sure that you're working and struggling. You might even have to agonize with each other to make sure you are grounded in your faith in that, because it doesn't get any better than that. And he's like, and I know, I know you're going to get arguments. I know people are going to come to you and start trying to convince you that that's not all there is to it. They're going to convince you that, no, Jesus isn't everything. You also need to add works, and you need to add all these other things to make you more presentable to God, to make you more than just a saved believer. You need to do all these things. They might even be backed by the spiritual forces of evil behind them with all their deceptions, with all their power that they were. And I was like, Paul's like, but you need to know something about them. They're, they're defeated. Christ disarmed them at the cross. He actually publicly shamed them. They have no control over you. Don't ever forget that. And he's like, okay, so now, now that we're getting into chapter 3, Paul's like, so if all of that is true, if everything I've just laid out is true, if that is true, since that really happened, and since what? In, in verse 1 of chapter 3, since you've been raised to new life, with Christ. If that is true, and that's an argument Paul started back in chapter 2, verse 12. I even have a little arrow going from 2.12 up to 3.1, because in 2.12, he says, with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Lest you forget, you started out dead. You came into this world dead in your sins, separated from God, an enemy of God, living in that domain of darkness. But he goes on in verse 13 of chapter 2, but God made you alive with Christ. And he's like, now, if that is true, what Paul's about to break out in chapter 3 is you need to start doing things in your life that are consistent with this new life. And the things that are not consistent with this new life you need to make a hard cut and get rid of them. But before we get into all the very specific applications that Paul gives us in chapter 3, again, starting from verse 5 and on, all the juicy stuff, Paul's like, we can't go there yet. Because before we get into all that really tangible, hands-on stuff, we need to make sure our minds and our heads are in the game of this new life. Otherwise, they're just going to be religious works and they're going to amount to nothing. So I've always been kind of a technology geek, especially when it comes to video games. I've been into video games since I was a little kid. That's always been my jam. Granted, I've had to give that up because that stuff's not good for me anymore. I realize that about myself. But I like to stay up to date in what the trends are because I got kids. They're eventually going to want this stuff, and I don't want to be the guys like, I don't know what it is, but I'll buy it for you anyways. Like, I want to know what's, what's going on. And the, one of the newest trends in video games now is virtual reality. And they actually have this technology for other things. There's even like exercise bikes you can get and ellipticals that's virtual reality so it looks like you're biking through Italy or like anywhere else you want to be. It's pretty cool stuff. But in the video game realm, they, you put on a little, your goggles, your mask, your virtual reality headset, you got two controllers and you're just immersed in this whole new world around you and you're like, doing stuff, and if you ever watch somebody doing it, it looks hilarious, because you're just seeing somebody standing in their living room or whatever, like, ducking and, like, jumping and moving and, like, swinging and stuff, and you're like, you look ridiculous, man, right? like, you look really silly, and they're like, well, you don't see the dragon I just fought, you don't see the cliff I just jumped down or the fireball I just ducked past, like, you don't see what I see, only I can see it with these goggles that I'm wearing, and I think in a similar fashion, Paul is telling us when we're raised to a new life with Christ, we have been immersed in a whole new reality. And, and only through God's word, only through the working of the Holy Spirit, are we able to have the eyes to see what's really going along, going on around us. And on the outside, it's going to look silly to people. They're going to be like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? It's like, well, you don't see what I see. The, uh, it's revealed to us through the Holy Spirit who lives in us, through Christ living in us. But what Paul is saying is, before we, we start being concerned with what other people think or do about us, he's saying, no, gang, you are living in a new reality. Now you need to make sure that you keep those eyes on. Because if you take those spiritual eyes off and just start looking at the world the way the world looks at the world, he's like, you have compromised everything. 
You need to make sure you are seeking to see things the way they really are in this new reality, in this new world. You need to not compromise in this new reality. So what we're going to talk about this morning, what these four verses are going to cover, your first filling in your notes, is do not compromise your new reality. Don't compromise your new reality. Don't ever stop looking through the spiritual eyes that God has given you. Because it's not automatic. We don't just automatically see everything the way God sees it. And, and no, we need to actually work at making sure we are seeing things the way that they are in this new reality. So to start living consistently, which is what all chapter 3 is about, to start living consistently in this new life that we've been raised to, this new reality we're in, Paul starts off with giving us two commands. And I want to make sure I say that again, two commands. These are not suggestions. And this is why I'm saying it's so easy to breeze past these verses, but we're going to spend time in them because they're that important. The first thing he says in verse 1 is set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Set your sights. What that very literally means is seek. Seek the things that are of heaven, that are above. Seek the realities of heaven. Strive for the things that are above. So that's a filling in your notes. Set your sights, which means seek. Paul's not saying, you might want to consider doing this. He's saying, because you've been raised to new life with Christ, do this. Set your sights what heaven's going to be like. That's a good thing to do. That's a good perspective to keep of what our eternal home is going to be. But Paul's not saying that. He's not saying, don't, don't use fantasies of heaven as an escape to, to avoid what's going on here and now. Well, let me just think of how good it's going to be. That is a good thing to do. That's not what he's telling us. Paul's telling us, Seek and think about the realities of heaven which are real, which are active, which are true, which are going on in and around you right now. You are right now living in the domain of the Son of God. Right now. It doesn't matter that we're sitting in a building off the side of Reaver Road. Right now, spiritually, you, if you are in Christ, you right now are living in the domain of the kingdom of God. You are right now living with a new standing before God on your best days and on your worst days. When you come to the throne of God, Jesus presents you to him holy, blameless, without a single fault in his eyes right now. This isn't once I die. No, this is right now. Christ, the ruler of this kingdom, is living in you right now. You have the Holy Spirit. You're like, this is nothing new. I know it's nothing new, but we forget this stuff. We want, we want what else is there? No, no. Paul's like, you need to focus on this. You need to seek this. These are the things, everything of Christ's nature, everything of his power, his resources, his blessings, they're all here for you right, right now. Right now, Paul's like, you need to seek these things out. You need to set your mind on these things. I remember playing hide-and-seek as a kid, and it's really fun because my kids are the right age now where they love playing hide-and-seek. And when I watch them play, I really think it's the kind of seeking Paul's talking about because the seeker, he don't give up. My kids are ruthless when they play hide-and-seek. Like, they will look high, they will look low, they'll scout the entire house. They'll discover parts of the house they didn't even know existed. Like, did you even know we had this room? No, but is he in here? Like, like they just are, they'll look back where they already looked before. They are constantly looking for who they're after. Or, another fun example, is I like watching my kids on Easter egg hunts. Like, when they're like, oh, there's prizes to be found? There's candy in some of those eggs? There's money in some of those eggs? My boys turn fanatical. They will... Let me tell you what, there is nothing that they won't find. There is no amount of time that they won't spend. There is no amount of energy they won't spend. There is no amount of creativity they won't spend to seek and find these daggone eggs. They're pulling plants out of potters, being like, is there anything? Like, 
pop the hood of dad's car, maybe stuck an egg, like, not really. But what I'm saying is the amount of time and energy and even creativity they put into seeking what they're after, they want it that bad, the things they know are in store for them. And I think Paul's going, do you have any idea what's in store for you right now? Do you have any idea what's available to you right now in these realities of heaven? Like, I think if you grasp that, that's the kind of seeking we would do. We, we would be, we'd be after it, nonstop running for it. That's what Paul is telling us to do. Set your sights on the realities of heaven. And what's he say? Where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. And I said, you can go to his throne. He beckons you to his throne, holy, blameless, without a fault in his eyes. And you can go to him and be like, if there's any part of Jesus that you want in your life, ask him for it. That's the invitation. He's like, do you want my patience? Do you want my love? Do you want my slowness to get angry? Do you want my gentleness, my kindness? Do you want my victory over temptation and sin? Jesus is like, it's all here for you. This is the reality in the world that you live in now. You're in my kingdom. What does he say? If you ask for anything in my name, I'll give it to you. Are you seeking these things? It's, it's, it's Christ's joy to make us more like him. And as I was writing this, I got challenged. Is that your joy too? Is that my joy? Is that my desire? Is that my longing to be more like Christ too? Or am I stuck in the temporary things of this world? Paul says in verses 2 and 3, Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life. Your real life is hidden with Christ and God. I like that the New Living pulls that out. Real life, because it lines up with the realities of heaven. This is your real life. But we so easily compromise that. We so easily compromise this new reality. I easily compromise knowing that this is the new reality I live in. I reduce myself to temporary pleasures and pursuits. Or, or worrying so much about things that are just going to fade away with the rest of this earth. Worrying about things that, that are going to be here today and gone tomorrow. Did Jesus not say, why do you worry about these things? Why do you worry about things like food and money and possessions and clothing? It actually, he goes further. He's like, why do you worry about the things that dominate the thoughts of people who don't even know me? Are they dominating your thoughts too? Is that what you're so set in seeking? Are all these temporary things that you're worrying about? But what does Jesus say in Matthew 6, 33? He says, but rather seek the kingdom of God above all else. Seek first the kingdom of God and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. He uses the same word that Paul uses, seek. Seek what? The kingdom of God, the kingdom we've been transferred to the new life that we've been raised to, the reality that we are now living in. Seek the things of that kingdom. Seek the things of the one who rules that kingdom. Seek them like kids playing hide-and-seek or, or seeking after Easter eggs. That's the kind of attitude, that's the kind of vigor that he's telling us, seek after these things. It's funny, as I've been preparing for this message all this past week, uh, trying to apply these four verses to my life and just kind of wrestle with them with God. It was back on Wednesday the 24th, and I don't always read a psalm and proverb in the morning as my morning reading. Sometimes I'll, I'll feel led to read something else, but this past week on Wednesday, I woke up first thing in the morning, I read those four verses in Colossians, and it was the 24th. I was like, I'll read a psalm and a proverb. So I went to Psalm 24, and look at just some of the verses I read. And I've read this before. In Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6, it says, Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God. And I've read that psalm before, and it used to bum me out to no end. 
Who can seek you, God? Who can be in your presence? Only those whose hearts are pure? God, you know the thoughts that have gone through my head this past week. Only those who don't worship idols? Dude, my heart's an idol factory. I'm like a dumb sheep. I'm so prone to wander after any of God's creation and worship that instead of the creator. Only those who never tell lies? I guess I'm excluded. And I would read that, and I'd be like, well, then I just need to try harder. I need to try harder to have a pure heart. I need to try harder to tell the truth. I need to try harder to only worship God with all of my will and all of my strength. Yet, what we read last week in Colossians 2, Paul was like, why? You really think religious works and all your own best self-efforts earn you favor with God? He's like, no, no, no. No, when you come to the presence of God, Jesus brings you there, holy, blameless, without fault. That's true right now. You don't do anything to earn this standing with God. So in light of that, I read Psalm 24 this past week, and it got me excited. Because I was like, okay, who can stand in the holy place of God? Who can stand in his presence? I'm like, well, I do, through Jesus Christ. It's done. So when it says, only those whose hands and hearts are pure, I'm like, oh, that means that's available to me. Only those who don't worship idols, that's available to me. Only those who never tell lies, that's available to me in the presence of God. So I started praying, God, give me a pure heart, man. If that is really from you and available to me, I want it. Give me purity today. Give me a heart that is faithful to you today. Give me a heart and a, and a mouth that does not speak anything but truth, because that is the character of God. And Jesus is like, I live in you. Do you want these things? I will give them to you. You have to seek after. I got fired up, and then I started reading Proverbs 24, and I got even more excited. I only got through the first four verses. All I'm doing, I'm just telling you how I applied these verses to my life, and maybe God will speak something to you. But I started reading Proverbs 24. I couldn't get past verse 4. I got so excited. It was like verses 3 and 4 says, A house is built by wisdom and becomes strong through good sense. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts of precious riches and valuables. I got so excited, I smacked Mandy. Fortunately, she, she was already awake, or she would have slugged the snot out of me. But I was like, babe, you've got to read these two verses. Look at this. We can build our house through God's wisdom. And it'll be strong through his sense and through his knowledge. Every room in this house will be filled with the riches of heaven. We can raise our kids in this kind of house. We can bring up our children in a home that is built on the wisdom of God and full of all the riches of heaven. I was like, God, yes! Get. And we started just talking about ways, even creative ways. That's why I used the word creativity. We started thinking of creative ways. How can we seek God's wisdom in this? How can we instill this into our homes? These are the realities of heaven that we are told to seek after. Things like if we're back in Colossians 3, starting, we'll, we'll scooch on over to like verse 12. Things like tender-hearted mercy can fill the rooms of my house. Kindness can fill every room of my house. Humility gentleness and patience can be the way that I raise my children and talk to others. Verse 13 gets a little crazy. Making allowance for each other's faults. Forgiving anyone who offends you as the Lord forgave you. That's available to me. Clothing myself in love, being bound together in perfect harmony, letting the peace that comes from Christ rule in my heart, that's all available. Yes, those are the realities. Those are the things, if I could say it this way, make up the atmosphere in this new reality that those who are in Christ live in. These are the things that are available to us, the things that we are told to seek after. So where do, we, where do we find these things? Okay, we're supposed to seek them. we got to know where to find them. Paul already covered this, but we'll recap it. This is so funny. When you read a letter all the way through, it's like, oh, that's why you started out the way you did. Because where to search for these things, these are a couple fill-ins in your notes. 
They're nothing new. We've already covered them for the past four weeks, but we seek them in God's word. We seek them in God's word. All the riches of God's wisdom and knowledge and understanding that he's revealed to us are revealed to us in Jesus Christ, who is revealed to us in his word. And you're still not making adequate time to spend in the Bible every day. You're still staying up late in front of your TV or your phone instead of going to bed early enough that you can wake up early enough to spend adequate time in God's Word. You're still starving yourself spiritually, but filling yourself up with all this other junk in the world. And forgive me, whenever I get fired up like this, it's because I'm talking to myself, but you're welcome to listen in on it. <laughs> There's so much in here. 30 seconds out of my morning. Wow. We seek the realities of heavens in God's word. We also seek them directly from God in prayer. We have direct access to the throne of God. We can come straight to him through Christ and be like, well, these are the things I read about, and I want them. Make me more like you. Give me these things. We seek them directly from God in prayer, and we seek them in his body, which is the church. These are, these are all the things that Paul covered in chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. He's telling us what to do with them. These aren't things that we just do or that we just attend. No, Paul's like, you need to have the attitude of a seeker. When we come together as a family on Sunday mornings and any time that you're together in a small group throughout the week, we come here seeking. It doesn't matter what kind of music gets played, what songs are played, who's standing up here at the podium, how comfortable the seats are, how hot or cold it is in here, how entertaining the presentation is. No, we're here to seek the things of God. We're here to seek the treasures, the realities of heaven that God says, when you gather together as a family, I will present them to you. If, if, that's, if that's not your heart, when you come here in the morning, start making it your heart. Have that attitude of a seeker. God, what are you going to show me today? What, what do you have for me today as we come together as your family? What are you going to reveal to me as I'm singing my heart out to you like you tell me to? What are you going to reveal to me as I'm praying to you? What are you going to reveal to me as we open your word together? Have that kind of excitement that kind of seeking. And then when we leave here and we go on about our day, what we need to start doing is disciplining ourselves to be conscientious of the realities of heaven. Where are they? Where can I find them, God? How will you reveal them to me? And it sounds like kind of a, a, a crazy idea, but think of it this way. If you've ever had to go on some kind of a diet or change your eating due to a health issue or health uh, condition, you know what disciplining yourself to be conscientious is. You do things like check ingredients on everything you're about to buy at the store. Is, there, is, there, is that in it? That's not good for me. Is there too much of that in it? I can't have that. Well, it's the same thing in our spiritual life as well. We start looking at things and, and being conscientious. God, is this, is this good for me? Like, I've got, my father-in-law is diabetic. Everything he does, he has to check what does he eat, what does he drink, so that he can stay healthy. His life depends on it. That, that's the attitude we need to have. I've got another friend who's diabetic who could care less about what he eats and drinks. He just lost half his leg. His life still depended on it, and he chose not to do anything with it. So as, as we go on about our days and, and start thinking about the things that we're going to be involved with throughout the day, Maybe the situation I'm about to put myself in, this conversation I'm about to have, this person I'm about to spend time with, God, is this healthy for me? Is this going to help me or is this going to hinder me from seeking the realities of heaven? Where my eyes are trying to go, where my feet 
are trying to take me? What's about to come out of my mouth? Is this consistent with the realities of heaven that are available to me? But what we saw last week, all that stuff comes from whatever condition our heart is in. Out of our heart is going to come whatever words we're about to say and wherever our, our actions are going to take us. It all comes from within our hearts. So something we have to absolutely start being conscientious about examining is what we allow into our hearts and minds. It, it's, it's why Paul gave us the second command in, in chapter 3, verse 2. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. He says the same thing in Philippians 4, where he says, fix your thoughts on these things. This is not an occasional, oh yeah, I thought about it for a few seconds. No, Paul's like, you need to fix your thoughts on it. You need to keep your thought life in line with the realities of heaven. Look over at verse uh, 16 of chapter 3. He says, let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. What do you fill your life with? Or why don't we start here? What do you fill your mind with? Because there is a ton out there that we can fill our minds with. And again, preparing this, getting all these convicting questions coming up in my mind. Like, if I can get together with you on any given day, and I can barely tell you what I read in God's Word that morning, but I can passionately recite to you in intricate detail what's going on in the world that I watched on the news, I can tell you what I'm filling my mind with. If I'm so preoccupied with entertainment that I can't even focus on God's message, and to be brutally honest, it doesn't really excite me or interest me at this point anyways because I'm so into this show or this game or this movie or whatever. I can tell you what's filling my mind. Or if I'm so consumed with worry, obsessing about the circumstances of my life and messages like this that tell me, you know, things of heaven are available to me, but I don't really care because I don't want that. All I want is ease and comfort now. I can tell you what I'm filling my mind with. You see, the Bible says wherever your heart is, your treasure is. Whatever you treasure, whatever you prize, whatever you desire, that's where your heart is going to be. Paul knows that, so he gave us verse 4. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. I'm open. Tell me what's better than that. Anybody got anything better than sharing in the glory of Christ? I'm all ears. In a thousand years from now, tell me what's going to be more important to you than sharing in the glory of Jesus Christ. Tell me what can compare to that. Just imagine that for just a moment. Imagine basking radiating, shining with Christ in all of his brilliant, blinding glory for the whole world to see. Like, the whole world is going to see us shining with Christ. That, that's crazy. Everybody who doubted, everybody who mocked us for our faith, everybody that persecuted the church is going to see Jesus in all of his glory and all of his believers shining with him. I have a feeling I'm going to be just as speechless as they are. But do you think in that moment any of us are going to nudge the person next to us and be like, can you believe what's going on in the world today? You know what I saw on the news is that we did it. Or is somebody going to nudge me and be like, did you catch up on the game last night? Man, tell you what. No, no. Nobody's going to give a care about any of that stuff because we are shining in the glory of Christ. And I'm not saying it's bad to watch or care about any other stuff like that. I'm just saying when it comes to the balance of it, if we were going to take all the time spent in God's word and seeking the realities of heaven and all the time spent in the things of the earth and seeking out the treasures of earth and we put them on a scale, would everything on the earth bring that scale done in a loud thud while the things of heaven just kind of trickle off into the air? What are you filling your mind with? That's why Paul gives us this command. It better be the realities of heaven, otherwise you've compromised your life. 
You are a compromised Christian because you care more about the world than you do about the things of heaven. We've all done it. I've done it. We've all compromised in this area. That's why these four verses are so critical to us. And here we are, sitting together as the family of God in the local church, and I pray you're with me, ready to work and to struggle and even agonize over us, making sure that our minds and our lives are filled with the realities of heaven, not the things of earth. Next week, we're going to look at things that are completely inconsistent with this new life. Not things like we just talked about that need to be balanced in our lives, not things that need to be taken in moderation in our lives, things that Paul's actually going to say you need to find them and kill them in our lives. But before we can look at any of that, our minds and our hearts need to be filled with the realities of heaven because that is what's going to empower us and give us the desire to actually kill these things instead of coddling them like we tend to do. Just a heads up, uh, some of the topics next week are going to be PG rated because Paul gets into the ugly parts of our sinful nature that we as a culture don't like to talk about or at least not talk about the way God's word talks about. But in closing up today's message, I wanted to take us all to Proverbs chapter 2 and kind of read and even pray through this together. Because I think Paul probably had Proverbs 2 on his mind when he wrote these four verses in Colossians. And they're in your notes, or you can just bow your head and kind of roll through this with me. I want you to just imagine that God himself is reading these verses to you. Just, just hear his voice speaking to you in this. When he says, My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. And so, Father, right now, give us insight. Give us your understanding. Tune our ears to treasure your wisdom and your commands and to concentrate our minds on them. He says, search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. God, may we put our feet in motion and seek after these things, these realities of heaven. He says, then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord, and you will gain knowledge of God. For the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest, he is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the paths of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. God, grant us your wisdom. Grant us your treasures, all the treasures of heaven that you say can fill our lives and our homes. He says, then you will understand what is right, what is just, what is there, and you will find the right way to go. I want all of that, God. I want to know what's right in this world that tells me everything's right and nothing's right. I want to know what's just. We live in so much injustice here, God. What is just? I want to know what's fair. I want to know what you call fair, God. And you will find the right way to go. God, I want that. He says, wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will fill you with joy. Wise choices will watch over you and understanding will keep you safe. So Father, instead of me seeking out my own safety, my own security, my own ideas of the ways to go, I want to seek you 
and your wisdom, your understanding, your knowledge, your commands. I want to value and treasure them. And you say the byproduct of that is that you will give us security. You will give us safety. You will show us the right way to go. Father, I pray by the spirit that's living in me. Your word tells me that your spirit is the spirit of love that has always existed between the Father and Son. It says in your word that it's by that spirit that we cry out, Abba, Father. We call you Dad with that kind of a love relationship. God, it stinks that I even have to pray this, but I know I don't love you enough. And I'm asking your spirit to cultivate and stir my heart to love you with the ferocity that Jesus loved you as he displayed it to us on earth. Where he said, everything the Father tells me I do, everything the Father tells me I say, it is my delight to honor the Father. God, I want that to be my life, and I know that it's available to me because that is the reality that I live in now. Father, as we leave here today, church doesn't end. Our walk with you doesn't end. God, I pray that you would start giving us consciousness of decisions that we make throughout our day. How we talk to people, how we interact, where we go, what we choose to watch, what we choose to listen to. Give us that burning question. Is this going to help me know and understand and dwell in the realities of the kingdom that I currently live in? Or are they going to hinder me? And if they're going to hinder me, I need to choose not to do them. God, give us knowledge. Show us who you are and your will for our lives. Give us wisdom and understanding as you have it. Let us see things the way you see them. Let us long for the things you long for. Let us hate and be disgusted by the things that you hate and are disgusted by. God, give us strength from your glorious power to have all the patience and all the endurance we're going to need for this life sustained with joy and thankfulness. And God, I pray that you would give us all many, many opportunities this week to share our faith with others, to tell others what you've done for us, to even just invite them to church. May we not compromise this new life that we have with you. And it's in Jesus' name we ask you. Amen. Amen. Have a great rest of your Sunday. And I hope to see you next week.